everyone. Welcome back. This is part two of unit two. We are going to take a look at chapter 10 and chapter 11 in this particular section. Chapter 10 is going to discuss um, viruses and then 11 will take a look at DNA and RNA, um, how their function and their structure are related to each other. Now, for chapter 10, as I mentioned, we're going to take a look at viruses, and our main purpose is to take a look at their replication cycles. So let's go ahead and take a look at some characteristics, and then we'll jump into the main concept of the chapter. Um, first off, a virus is not consider considered a living entity, um, and that is because it's dependent on a host cell for it to maintain um, its livelihood and its replication pattern. We obviously have been exposed to a wider range of viruses in some of the previous classes we have taken, and even given the current situation that we find ourselves in right now, we are inundated with information about the coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, one thing I want to discuss with you in this chapter is that viruses can be composed of both RNA and DNA. We're also going to talk about bacteriophages, You've heard that term before. A bacteriophage is going to be a virus that specifically has um, a bacteria as their host cell. So viruses that infect bacteria exclusively are called bacteriophages. Now, as I mentioned to you before, with the virus, it does depend on a host. So what the virus needs to do is it needs to go ahead and infect and utilize its host cell as its replication template. And it will do so by utilizing the DNA within the genome um, for its replication pattern. We also know that besides having a wide range of different hosts that viruses will um, target, we also know that from a structural aspect, there are some differences and commonality. A lot of viruses will have a protein coat that's made out of these little subunits called capsomeres. Collectively, this will form the capsid. And the capsid can come in different sizes and shapes. And if you bear with me in a few, I'll show you some pictures of different viruses. And we can, for instance, see what it looks like when it's like a hexagon shape or a helical shape. Some viruses will also have an additional viral envelope that will surround the capsid. What's unique about the viral envelope is that oftentimes it's actually made from sections of the plasma membrane of the host cell. And when the virus buds out of the host cell in an attempt to amplify or increase its viral load, it will actually pinch off a piece of the plasma membrane of the host cell and use that as part of its viral envelope. And at the bottom, you can see that we have known that nucleic acids can be found in viruses, making their viral genome either RNA or DNA. When it comes to the host range, when we go and we start looking at some examples of our viruses, we're going to notice that you have some that can have a very broad range. Um, the TMV virus, which stands for the tobacco mosaic virus, is one of those that can go ahead and infect a wide variety of plants. Um, whereas there are viruses that are very specific and will only target one single species or even one single cell type. And when it comes to the single cell type, we have to go ahead and mention influenza, which most of us just go ahead and call the seasonal flu. We know that those viruses tend to be specifically aimed at the lung cells, thereby causing a lot of respiratory issues that we associate with the clinical application. A lot of what we know about the structure of the viruses came to light first in the 1930s with the invention of the electron microscope. And the reason you need an electron microscope, it all has to do with size. Go ahead and take a look at this information that's on your PowerPoint. The typical size of a virus is anywhere from 20 to 400 nanometers. And in case you want to know how small is that exactly, well, a single bacteria cell is about a thousand nanometers. Neither we can see with the naked eye. So as you can imagine with a regular light microscope, you're able to see a bacterium. But if you want to get even smaller, you are going to have to utilize an electron microscope to not only increase your magnification, but also your resolution. Now at the bottom of the PowerPoint is a little bit of some redundant information because we'd already mentioned that a lot of viruses will have that protein layer of capsid. But over here, it does highlight the fact that the individual protein subunits are capsomeres. And then, as I said to you before, they will also tend to have a viral envelope 
not all viruses have them, but when they do have a viral envelope, it will go ahead and encase or surround the capsid, and most of the time it will be made from the plasma membrane of the host cell. You will also see in a little bit when I start showing you some pictures of viruses that a lot of them will have different knobs or spikes, different types of structures that will extend from the viral envelope. And a lot of times these will increase the compatibility that they have to connect and insert um, the viral load into the host cell. So they can use it as an anchoring or an attachment point. And lastly, before we take a look at our pictures, um, I'd also mentioned to you before that viruses, we know that they have their own individual genome, and that genome can be anything from DNA to RNA, and we know that it can also be single-stranded or double-stranded in a circular or in a linear format. But either way, so what we see happening is that the size will usually go ahead and vary from a few thousands to over 100,000 nucleotide spaces that we are looking at. All right, so let's explore a few of the common viruses that are out there. And this is just for those of us who are more visually inclined and kind of want to see what we're talking about in some specific example. So let's see what we are looking for. So the first virus that we have over here on the illustrated one, this is called your TMV virus. And your TMV virus is unique in many ways. Here you go, your TMV virus. As you can see from an anatomical standpoint, um, it does not have an envelope. It has a helical capsid, and you can come over here on the right-hand side, and you can see the capsomere subunits in their helical format. It is an RNA-based virus, and the reason I said the TMV virus is one of those unique ones is because it turns out that the TMV virus is able to go ahead and infect a wide variety of different plant species. And what we see happening is when the virus infects the plant, it will often create almost like a mosaic like pattern of dark spots all over the leaves, causing massive discoloration. And usually this tends to hinder the overall growth of the plant. Most of the time it will not kill the plant, but it will hinder um, the overall development. So the plant won't be as large or as robust as we would like it to be. Another unique factor about DMV is that this was actually the first virus to be discovered. So how cool is that? The next one below it is an example of the adenovirus. And an adenovirus is, uh, there's a wide variety of them. It's also a non-enveloped virus. In this case, the capsids will make more of a polyhedral format. So I will try to draw as best as I can. I would like to say I'm getting better at this, but I'm really not getting better. <laughs> All right, what we also see happening over here is that actually the name of the adenovirus comes from the fact that it was initially isolated in the human adenoids. So that's a little fun fact. Um, we know that adenoviruses can have a broad range of different vertebrate hosts, and we see that when it comes to stereotypical, their clinical applications, um, it can have a wide range of symptoms, but most of them will involve respiratory infections. Um, and in some cases, especially if the person is already immunocompromised, it can be deadly. So when it comes to the genome, we see that the adenovirus will have a DNA based genome. Okay, so both of these are examples of viruses that do not have an envelope that surrounds the capsid. The next virus that we're seeing is one that we should obviously be very familiar with, and that is the good old fashioned common cold annual flu season. I'm sorry, it's not the common cold, the annual flu virus that we know that we should obviously be taking our flu vaccines for, and this is influenza. So influenza, once again, a wide category of different viruses. What we can see happening over here is that if we look at its structure, we're going to notice that it has a polyhedral capsule. And in addition to that, it will also have an extra layer around it. And that, ladies and gents, is your viral envelope. Also notice how it has little spiked glycoproteins. This makes it easier to attach to its host. And with the influenza, obviously, we see that even though it has a wide range of host, it does like to target lung tissue cells. And because of that, we see that a lot of the symptoms will be respiratory based when we take a look at our infected patients. 
At the bottom, we have our T4. The T4 is a bacteriophage, and that means it is a virus that will exclusively target bacterial host cell. In this case, T4 loves to go after E. coli. Um, T4 has been studied extensively because it has a very simplistic structure, which makes it easy to manipulate and utilize as a vector in case we want to go ahead and have um, genomic material transferred or manipulated in a laboratory setting to introduce it into a different host cell. When you look at the structure of the T4, you're going to notice that the head section is its polyhedral capsule, and inside of it, it will house its DNA genomic material. And usually what we'll see is that, before we start, this kind of looks like a little spaceship. The base plate and the tail fiber of the T4 will land on the host cell, and it will eject its genomic information into the cell. And once it has access to the genome of the bacteria, it will go ahead and start replicating its viral load. All right, now speaking of replication, it turns out that when we look at viruses, its power really comes from the fact that they're able to infect a host cell. And once they infect the host cell, they will go ahead and use the host genome to increase the viral load and make more viral particles. In order to do that, we see that the viral reproductive cycle will include six steps. It needs to attach, it needs to enter, it may need to integrate, and I'll talk to you about that in a little bit more, um, but it will definitely need to synthesize assemble, and that basically means that I'm putting together my capsomeres, I'm putting together my viral envelope if need be, and last but not least, it needs to release. And when it's releasing, that's the part where it's spreading, meaning that it's leaving the initial host cell, and it's on its way to amplify additional cells in the organism. Now, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about these six steps, and I'll explain to you why step three is not always seen. Alrighty, so step one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, we need to make sure that the virus can line up with its proper host cell, and when it does so, it needs to go ahead and make a physical connection or an attachment to it. And once it does so, what we see happening is that there are certain proteins, um, such as those spikes and the knobs that we saw on some of our illustrations, that will actually increase the interaction with the host cell, cell membrane. Once the attachment step is made, then the second step is to enter. And entry basically indicates that the viral genome of the virus is going to go ahead and be inserted into the cytoplasmic of the host cell. And at this point, we can see that the virus can either go ahead and simply just release its genome, so the DNA and the RNA, or it can also release some of the associated proteins that it might need for its replication cycle. All right, now step three is a little bit of an optional step because it turns out that sometimes the virus can integrate into the host chromosome. And when I see integrate, that literally means that it's gonna merge together. It's gonna insert the viral DNA into the host DNA, and it's gonna obviously try to lay there dormant. And it's just gonna stay there. So on your PowerPoint, I wrote down that if the virus wants to integrate into the host chromosome, it is gonna to have to use a specialized enzyme called the integrase enzyme. And that will allow the two DNA sources to merge together. And if you now see that you have a recombination of host chromosome and viral DNA, we call that a prophage. And in the prophase, what you have in many instances is you can refer to it as a dormant virus. It's there, it's integrated into the host DNA, but it's not actively destroying the host cell just yet. It is just basically going along with the cell cycle of the host cell. If we see that the virus takes this integration step, then we see that it's part of what we call the lysogenic cycle. So anytime you see the mention of lysogenic, I want you to think about the fact that after entry, or I should say after attachment and entry, the virus will go ahead and integrate itself and stay within the genome and form a prophage. Not all viruses will do that. Some viruses, after they do their attachment and they have their entry, 
as soon as they have access to the host chromosome, they will skip the integration step and move right over to step number four. Step number four is then when we're using the DNA of the host as a template so that we can start initiating transcription and translation of the genes and the proteins. And we are replicating the viral nucleic acids so that we can increase the overall viral load that is infecting the organism. Now, we can do this a few ways, and there's going to be some terminology that you'll come across. If you see that the virus is a DNA-based virus, then it will go ahead and just use DNA replication like you would normally see, and it would thereby increase its genomic information. On the other hand, if you have an RNA-based virus, and here is me trying to write down RNA, if you have an RNA-based virus, we like to call that a retrovirus. And in order for the retrovirus to be amplified or to increase its load, what we need to happen is we need to utilize a reverse transcriptase enzyme so that we can take the viral RNA and utilize the DNA template of the host to make viral DNA. And that production of viral DNA from an original RNA and utilizing the reverse transcriptase, that is then what we like to call a provirus. So a provirus just indicates that it was originally an RNA-based, and now we're replicating in DNA style because of the use of the reverse transcriptase. Once the DNA has replicated itself and the proteins, the viral proteins, are being produced, then the next step will be to assemble everything together. So step number five basically says that now we're going to go ahead and take all the materials that we've produced and we're going to put them together in the form of our infectious particle, aka our viruses. Some viruses will automatically come together. Others need additional proteins to assemble. But either way, what we see is that once the bacteria, excuse me, once the virus has been assembled, then the last step will be to release itself from the host cell. And when it releases itself, we have two options. We can go ahead and just kill off the cell by lysis. So just cause it to kind of burst open and pull apart. Bacteriophages love to use that. They will just completely obliterate and destroy the cell as they're being released. Some viruses, um, including some eukaryotic viruses, they will be pinched off. So they'll make a little bud. And what we see happening is that the cell isn't necessarily destroyed. It's just going to be pinching off little viral particles. And oftentimes when it pinches off from the cell, it uses the cell membrane of the host cell as a way to go ahead and make its little envelope section that we saw in our previous illustrations. All right, you know what we can do is let's go ahead and take a look at a bacteriophage replication cycle, and then we can also take a look at how the HIV virus replicates, and we'll use some illustrated examples to kind of see if we can identify all of our six steps that we've been chit-chatting about thus far. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a picture, uh, take a look at this picture, and what we're going to do is we're going to start on the top part of the picture. The bottom part right here is going to be for our second example. So we're going to take a look at part A, which is the reproductive sample, reproductive cycle of your bacteriophage lambda. This one has a double-strand DNA, and it's a bacteriophage, which means that we're looking at a virus that needs to have a host cell that is a bacteria. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we're going to apply our six steps for this. So the first one is attachment. So go ahead. So you see right here that it says that the phage will bind specifically to the proteins on the membrane of the host cell, and it will go ahead and make its entry. And the entry means that it's releasing its genomic material into the cytoplasm of the host cell. Now, in this case right here, we see that step three is utilized, and we're going to have integration. And as you might recall from our previous PowerPoint, it said that integration means that I'm going to take my viral DNA and I'm going to use my integrase enzyme so that I can go ahead and incorporate the viral DNA into my host DNA, thereby creating a prophage. 
And as the prophase is inserted, what we see happening is every single time that the cell replicates, so does the prophase. And oftentimes people will tell you, well, does that mean that the virus lays dormant? And yes, you can utilize that. You can say it's lying dormant or it's lying latent. Um, it is going to utilize the lysogenic cycle. And the lysogenic cycle just simply means that we are not destroying the host cell. We are not destroying the genome of the host. The bacterial chromosome is staying intact. We have simply inserted the viral genome. Now, eventually, what we do see happening is that the cell will switch over from the lysogenic cycle into the lytic cycle. And the lytic cycle is when you're aggressively replicating the viral DNA. And in order to do that, we're going to have to take out the viral genome and use the bacterial chromosome as a template to go ahead and replicate our viral load, aka we're going to move on to step number four. Now, let's take a look at what that entails. So if the bacteriophage leaves the lysogenic cycle and goes into the lytic cycle, then what we see happening is we need to synthesize our viral components. So it says right here, it says in the lytic cycle, the phage DNA will start to synthesize its viral components. And in order to do that, look what it did to the bacterial chromosome. It completely destroyed it. It will fragment the host DNA so it can utilize it as a template. And as it's doing that, it's able to start producing its DNA in this case, as well as its different proteins so that in step number five, it can do its viral assembly. And last but not least, it will release the viral load. Now notice how in this example, when the virus, the bacteriophage is removed, it completely destroys the bacteria cell. So this is what I meant when I said it will lyse the cell. It will literally cause it to pop open. In fact, bacteriophages get their name because phage means to consume or to eat. So the bacteriophage will literally eat the bacteria cell. Just a little FYI. All right, so that was our utilization of both the lysogenic and the lytic cycle. Okay, so lysogenic means that I took my moment to utilize step number three and I was integrated. The lytic cycle means that I'm basically on my way to use the DNA template and to keep replicating. I am not staying dormant. I'm not waiting. I'm increasing my viral load and I'm going to go ahead and start assembling and releasing. Let's go ahead and compare now how your HIV virus does the infection. Okay, so I'm going to switch over. And now what we're looking at is the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. We know that this is a retrovirus. And retrovirus, remember, that means that it starts with an RNA base. And in order for it to be successful in its replication cycle, it will need to utilize a reverse transcriptase enzyme so it can go ahead and utilize, <clears throat> excuse me, convert the RNA from the virus utilizing the DNA template of the host so it can amplify its DNA viral load, thereby creating a provirus. All right, so here's our little provirus. All right, so please take a look at the bottom part of the slide now. The top part was when we were talking about our bacteriophage. Now we're going to concentrate on our HIV virus. And you're going to notice that we're going to start off the same. We're going to go ahead and make our attachment. Now, in this case, what we do see is that the HIV virus does have little glycoprotein attachments. And it turns out that they do this thing called a receptor-mediated endocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis means that the spike glycoproteins on the HIV have to find specific receptors on a specific host cell, and it's only when they match up to these receptors that they're able to do their entry pathway. And in the case of the HIV, the specific host cell that they're looking for is a TH cell, um, a helper T cell, which is part of your adaptive immune system or your um, specific immune system. Your TH cell, your um, helper T cells are an instrument very important part of your immune surveillance, meaning that they keep your body as healthy as they possibly can. 
And what the HIV virus does is it tricks the helper cell into engulfing it, thinking that it's going to destroy the virus. But when the virus makes its attachment and its entry, we see that it will go ahead and utilize its reverse transcriptase to convert its RNA into DNA, thereby going ahead and creating a provirus. Now, HIV will often utilize integration. And remember, integration basically means that I'm going to use my integrase enzyme and I'm going to insert my viral DNA into my host DNA. And because I started off with a retrovirus, now I'm going to call it a provirus when that integration goes. And HIV will sit there, and it can sit there for months, it can sit there for years, and every single time, it's load, it's just being amplified by the host cell, but it will just sit there dormant, under control. And eventually what we see happening is that it will go ahead and leave the lysogenic cycle, and it will go into the lytic cycle. And the lytic cycle means that it's going to go ahead and start synthesizing viral components. And as it's synthesizing the viral components, remember once we have our viral RNA and we have any of the proteins that we require, what we see happening is that we do our viral assembly. And last but not least, we do our release. Now, one thing I do want to point out over here is notice how the release of the HIV virus is completely different than that of the bacteriophage. It does not lice open the T cell. Instead, what it will do is it will bud off. And as it's budding off, it's taking a piece of the cell membrane to utilize to make its glycoproteins and its um, nuclear envelope. Now, I will let you know that oftentimes the T cell is destroyed, even though it's not popped open and lysed open. And that's because often during the synthesis, of the viral components, the DNA and the T cell is fragmented and destroyed so that the cell can no longer survive by itself. Now, in case you're wondering how are HIV and AIDS related, well, what ends up happening is as you increase your viral load of HIV when it's in the lytic cycle and it's amplifying its response, it will go ahead and seek out more TH cell, helper T cells. And as those cells become infected and they start getting destroyed, as the numbers dwindle down, the patient will progress in disease and eventually will then be upgraded to the diagnosis of AIDS. So it's very important for patients with HIV to try to keep their viral load as low as possible so that they maintain the lysogenic cycle where the virus is lying dormant and it's not causing a lot of the symptoms that we associate with AIDS. And that's another important thing that I want to bring up with you. Since a virus is not considered a living entity, once it has access to the host cell, um, the virus will stay with you for the rest of your life. So any and all viruses that you've ever been exposed to in your lifetime, whether it's something as, um, you know, you were exposed to the flu or if you have things like chicken pox, those viruses never leave. They just simply lie dormant. They lie in step number three in the integration step. They just lie dormant in their host cell. And this can be because your immune system is keeping them at bay. And most of the time, they won't even make another reappearance. But for instance, in a virus like chicken pox, um, later on in life, it's actually quite common for that virus to make another appearance. And in that case, we then call it shingles. And usually that's associated with older age or anything that can be very stressful and lowers the immune system could cause the virus to use that opportunity to amplify its viral load, switch over to the lytic cycle, and thereby cause a lot of symptoms that are associated with the infectious particle. I also want to mention that one of the methods that they're utilizing to combat the fight against HIV and AIDS is they're trying to develop um, a vaccine that will shield the glycoproteins and the receptors on the host cell. And if we can hide these receptors, that means that if the virus does, is introduced in the body, it will not be able to find the receptors of the host helper T cells which means it won't be able to attach and integrate, which is fantastic because if it can't find a host cell, the virus will obviously die off. So that's one of the mechanisms that they're trying to use to lower the transmission rate of this horrible disease.
All right, and as I mentioned to you before, some viruses do have a latency, which is an inactive stage. So some people like to say, oh, this is when the virus is lying dormant. This is also when the virus is in step number three. So it has integrated itself and it just sits there and it waits. And remember from our illustration, we were calling it a prophage if we were looking at a bacteriophage model, or we were calling it a provirus if we were looking at it from an RNA-based virus that needs to use a DNA template. We also see that if we utilize step number three, that we are in the lysogenic cycle. And there are some viruses out there, uh, or I should say phages and viruses, that can be what we call temperate. Temperate means that they have the ability to go ahead back and forth from the latent and the lysogenic and lytic cycle. Um, the viral phage means that it tends to only have a lytic cycle. So that means that as soon as the virus makes contact with the host cell, it will not lie dormant. It will immediately go into its replication and distributing cycle. All right, so here's the comparison of the lytic cycle versus the lysogenic cycle. So hopefully this will clear up any confusions that you might have as I've been rambling off. So here we go. Let's take a look at the lytic cycle first, right? So in the lytic cycle, I could see that I have my bacteriophage that's injecting or attaching itself to the host cell. It's going to go ahead and make its insertion. And because it's the lytic cycle, that means that we're not going to integrate. So instead, what we see happening is that immediately when the phage DNA has access to the bacterial chromosome, it will go ahead and destroy that chromosome, utilizing it as a template so it can go ahead and increase its viral load and synthesize its genomic material and proteins. Once it has amplified, it will go ahead and release itself from the host cell. And on its way, it goes to infect even more uh, host cells and amplify its load even more. On the other hand, and I'm going to switch colors. Look at me getting all fancy. Um, how about purple? Okay. On the other hand, if we do a lysogenic cycle, then what we see happening is that once we made our attachment and our entry, we see that if the viral DNA is inserted into the cytoplasmic content, instead of directly synthesizing it, we're going to go ahead and integrate into the host chromosome. And as we're doing that, you can see we're making a little prophage. And that means every single time as the host cell replicates itself, so does the viral DNA. Because at this point, it's one and the same. The viral DNA is fully incorporated into the host DNA. At one point or another, what we see happening is that you can go ahead and cause the um, excision or removal of the viral DNA from the host cell. And if that happens, that usually indicates the end of the lysogenic cycle and that the cell will go ahead and switch over to the lytic cycle where it will proceed with fragmenting the bacterial DNA and increasing its viral load. So to kind of summarize it, if you want your virus to lay dormant, you need to use the lysogenic cycle, which means you're going to utilize your step number three. If you want your virus to be fully um, uh, in attack mode and just increase its viral load and go ahead and attack and infect more whole cells, you need it to be in the lytic cycle. And in the lytic cycle, we are skipping the integration step. We are simply attaching entering and then using the host chromosome as a template to increase our viral load, assemble more cells, and then release it from the initial host cell on their way to go ahead and find more cells to infect. There are obviously a wide variety of different viruses that are out there. And believe me when I say, when the new edition of our genetics book that we're using right now comes out, there will definitely be a mention of the COVID virus, which causes the coronavirus. So the COVID virus um, is a coronavirus. It's called COVID-19. The CO indicates that it's corona. Corona means that it tends to target upper respiratory tract infections. 19 because it was discovered in 2019 and what we see happening with the COVID-19 is that it is actively in a lytic cycle meaning that as soon as it finds its host cell it goes ahead and makes its attachment 
it entries, it starts to proliferate, and it increases its viral load. Now, we already know a lot about coronaviruses because there are many different ones that are out there. However, this one is different because it's presenting us with some of foreign antigens that our body has never seen before. And that is then what lies in the fact that our body has to figure out specific antibodies and specific killer T cells to combat this particular virus. Now, obviously, we're looking to help out patients that become affected as best as we can. And one of the ways that they're looking for now is to obviously limit the replication cycle of the virus by coming up with medication that might suppress some of the protein um, that the virus needs to replicate or make it harder for the virus to attach and enter into the host cell. We also see that they're looking for patients that have survived the virus and they want to extract plasma from the patients. Those patients will have antibodies in their plasma that are specifically aimed at this emerging virus that most of us have never seen before. Another question that I get about COVID-19 is why is it that so many people will get it and they won't even realize that they have it? And part of that has to do with one, the initial load that you're exposed to, but for many of us, it also has to do with the fact that we have a robust immune system that has seen previous viruses before and are able to limit the replication cycle of this particular COVID-19. And therefore, we don't even see any of the symptoms because the immune system is able to keep it at bay. Obviously, people who are older or who are immunocompromised, they do not have as robust of an immune system, which makes it easier for the virus to kind of overwhelm, and that obviously can have some deadly consequences. Now, an example that we have listed over here, because obviously our book has not been updated yet with the coronavirus, is the H1N1 influenza. Many of us might remember this from a few years ago because it was known as the swine flu. It was an emerging virus because it initiated from a pig species that was able to mutate and hop over to a human host. And in fact, data is now showing that the coronavirus most likely also came from another animal, most likely a bat that mutated before it went into its human host. Another virus that's not really an emerging virus, but it's one that's often investigated because we are still trying to keep it at bay, is the one that we saw in our model for our lysogenic and lytic cycle when we were looking at HIV. Uh, HIV, as I mentioned to you before, it will go ahead and target its helper T cells as the host. And the problem with this is your helper T cells play such an important role in your immune surveillance and your robust immune system itself, that as the HIV virus spreads and increases its load, it lowers the number of helper T cells you have, thereby reducing your immune system. And the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of patients, if they succumb from AIDS, actually do not die from the viral infection. They often die from something that's called an opportunistic infection, a disease that's able to amplify and progress quickly due to the fact that the immune system was severely lowered. Um, a lot of patients, <coughs> excuse me, for instance, will die from pneumonia, something that a healthy person could easily fight off. Patients that have HIV and AIDS, because they're missing such a large amount of helper T cells, they're not able to fight it off. And unfortunately, they die from this opportunistic infection. Um, let's see what it says here at the bottom. Oh, please remember that HIV is an RNA-based virus, so it will use the reverse transcriptase to go ahead and make its uh, DNA copies. And we also see that because it's a relatively short strand of virus, um, or genome material, excuse me, it is able to replicate quite quickly. And the problem with it is the quicker it can replicate, the more likely you have that mutations will start to develop. And the problem with mutations is that it will often allow the virus to have different phenotypical appearances, which makes it harder to treat when you have a drug that takes several years before it's available to the patients. So this is one of the reasons why they're trying to come up with ways to limit the transmission rate. And also oftentimes they will look for cocktails, combinations of drugs that will be able to curtail to different mutant strands of the virus. Alrighty, 
Now, lab 11 is going to take a look at the structure and function of DNA and RNA. And I think that for many of us, as we peruse through lab 11, we're going to come across a lot of very familiar information. So hopefully this will be one that we'll kind of have to remind ourselves of some of the terminologies. Um, but beyond that, we should be okay. But keep in mind that if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please do not be shy. Keep emailing me and posting them in the discussion sessions. And we can always set up a Blackboard Collaborate. All right. So DNA and RNA are both composed, um, are both categorized as nucleic acids. That is their polymer, uh, polymer classification. And what we see is that nucleic acids are composed of nucleotides. And the nucleotides are going to be your things like your adenine, your thymine, your guanine, and your cytosine. So the macromolecule that's a nucleic acid is made out of nucleotides. The nucleotides will link together, and what we see happening in the case of RNA, we tend to have mostly a single strand. Um, however, in the case of DNA, most of it will be a double strand, which will then give rise to the double helix. And as you've become familiar with DNA now, what we see happening is that since our cells have such a massive amount of DNA, the DNA will eventually go ahead and need to bend and coil and compress, eventually giving us the shape of our 23 pairs of chromosomes. So here's an illustration of the nucleotides. So these are the building blocks of the nucleic acids. And you can see your adenine, your guanine, your cytosine, and your thymine. Now, hopefully some of you are going, wait, we're missing uracil. You're completely correct. And remember, uracil, that one is exclusive for RNA. So you can see right here the progression of the shape of DNA. The nucleotides will first line up in a single strand. They will then form their double helix. This is all in the case of DNA. And now what we'll talk about in the chapter as well is that DNA, as it starts to coil, will acquire more of a three-dimensional structure as it starts to form its nucleosomes and its chromatin. Now, when we're looking at our overall nuclei structure and the repeat formation of the overall DNA and RNA molecule, what we usually see is that in addition, uh, in addition to having the nucleotides, they will also have a phosphate group and a pentose sugar. The phosphate group and the pentose sugar, which can either be the deoxyribose or the ribose that forms the D or the R in DNA and RNA, those will form the backbone of our genomic structures. And then the nucleotides will form the nitrogen's basis, and these can be classified based on their chemical composition, or I could really say their anatomical formation in either a purine or a pyridine. Um, the purines are adenine or guanine, and that means that when we look at their chemical structure, it's going to have a double ring formation. The pyridines are a single ring formation, and those are going to be your thymine, your cytosine, and your uracil. Now, for those of us who are not as inclined in chemical structure as most of us are, let's take a look at some illustrations. So, for instance, right here, here's my little phosphate group. Here's my sugar. So this is forming my backbone. And then right over here, these are my nucleotides. And what you're going to notice from a chemical aspect is they can have a double ring or they can have a single ring structure. If you see that they have a double ring, we call those purines. And as you can see, our examples are going to be adenine and guanine, A and G. Your pyridines means that they have a single ring, and those are going to be the rest of them, the thymine and the cytosine, and then your uracil. So keep in mind that thymine, the T, is exclusive to DNA and uracil is exclusive to RNA. The rest of them, the A, the G, and the C, those can be found in both. All right, so here's just a look at the sugar. So you could see your deoxyribose versus our ribose sugar that will make up our deoxyribose nucleic acid, aka our DNA, or our ribonucleic acid, our RNA. These will go ahead and form the backbone section. And as you can see, the base itself, that is then where you're going to have your A, your G, your C, 
your T and your U interacting with each other. Now, one thing I also want to point out is as we're looking at our sugar, go ahead and take a look at the numeration of the carbons. And you want to basically take a look at the three prime and the five prime. These are locational terms that are going to come into play in a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of point out in case you see a three prime and a five prime mention, it's coming off the orientation of the carbons on the sugar. All right, now keeping the backbone linked together, what we see happening is that we're going to use a phosphodiester linkage. And the way the phosphodiester linkage is going to happen is that the phosphates are going to line up and they're basically going to run in an anti-parallel strand. And what that means is that we're going to take the carbon orientation and what we see happening is that the phosphate will start interacting, for instance, on the five prime end. And as it continues to connect with the phosphates, what we see happening is that it will go from five prime to three prime. So that's how the phosphates are going to line up. So the strand will run starting with five prime on top and three prime pointing at the bottom. And I'll show you what I mean with that in just one second. This is important to note because this is going to form our basis of our backbone. So the fact that we have a phosphodiester linkage and that the way the sugars are going to be aligned is that in this example, the five prime is going to be pointing upwards and then the three prime is going to be pointing downwards. All right, so here, here we can see it. So here's our little backbone. There is our phosphate with our sugar, and then we're making our phosphodiester linkage. And what it's showing you is that in order for it to be stable and have the best linkage group, we see that the five prime right over here is pointing upwards and the three prime is pointing downwards. So you can see right here, it runs from five to three. And all of the sugars will be oriented that way. Five on top, three at the bottom. Five on top, three at the bottom. So this is one single strand of DNA. And in a little bit, we're gonna have to talk about what's happening on the other end, because remember, it's a double strand, right? So for now, we see that the backbones are aligned, making their phosphodiester linkage with the five prime pointing upwards, and the three prime pointing downwards. And we're gonna continue the story in a little bit, but before we do that, we have to talk about what is the most stable way to get the little nucleotides to interact with each other. And for that, we're gonna to have to visit Gargaff's rule. Okay, so Gargaff's rule is based on the fact that when they were discovering, or I should say researching the structure of DNA and RNA, they were quickly able to find out that DNA is composed of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And what Gargaff was able to stipulate is the fact that the amount of adenine will always be very closely related to the amount of thymine. So A equals T. And the amount of guanine is always very close to that of cytosine. So G equals C. And it turns out that the ratio of this corresponds to the fact that if you want to create the most stable form of DNA, what you can do is you can take your adenine on one side and get it to hydrogen bond to a thymine on the other side of DNA. And the same is true for guanine and cytosine. So A likes to bind with T and G likes to bind with C. So that then means that if I know what's happening on one side of my DNA, I can predict what's happening with my second strand. What do I mean with that? Well, let's say we have an issue and we come across a single strand of DNA and we're able to read its nucleotide sequence. And we see that the nucleotide sequence is C, T, A, and G. So that's the nucleotide sequence that we see on one piece of DNA. And what if I now say to you, well, what does the complementary strand of DNA look like? Because we know DNA is a double strand. So if you know one piece, what does the other piece look like? Well, we're going to keep in mind Gargaff's rule, and we're going to utilize that to solve the problem. Because if I know what one side looks like, then I will automatically know which letters like the complementary bind with each other. So I know that my C will most likely be hydrogen bonded to my G. My T will most likely be hydrogen bonded to my A. 
my A will be bonded with my T, and my G will be bonded with my C. And because they like to make these matches like so, that is then why we're able to have the ratios that Gargas rules tells us. Whatever amount of A you have, you have the same of T. Whatever amount of G you have, you have the same amount in C. Another way you can tackle it is if I say to you, um, you have a DNA sample, and that DNA sample is made out of, I should say, the DNA sample is 30% composed of adenines. Boop, boop. How many cytosines do you have? How are we going to solve this, right? Because I'm talking about adenine. How am I supposed to know about cytosine? Well, remember, according to Gargas rule, I'm going to switch colors again because I'm feeling very fancy with my color changes lately. If I know what A is doing, then I also know what T is doing. So if I have 30% A, that means that I also have 30% of T. So that means between these two letters, this takes care of how much? 60% of my sample. Oh, that's a six. Oh, we got it. There you go. So that means that the rest of my DNA sample is going to be 40%, and it's going to be a mix of C and G. So that means that if C and G make up 40%, then C will make up 20%. There you go. Look at you, you signed up for a genetics class and I gave you some math for free. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, now many of you have heard of Watson and Crick. They are the ones that get credited for discovering the overall structure of DNA. Don't forget about my little Rosalind Franklin, okay? We'll talk about her another day. But she is also an imperative part of this because she took a lot of the um, pictures that were needed to orient the nucleotide basis correctly. But we'll pick that discussion up in a little discussion session. I'm interested to see your thoughts about what Rosie should be credited with. But either way, in the 50s, there was a rush to kind of figure out exactly what does DNA look like and how are these nucleotides aligned? They knew about the adenine, the thymine, the guanine, and the cytosine. They knew that A had to equal T and G had to equal C, but they weren't sure exactly how they interacted with each other. So here come Rosalind Parker, Franklin with her pictures, and Watson and Crick might have just peeked at them a little bit, and they quickly figured out that if you wanted to orient them properly, you would not only have to bind A with T using two hydrogen bonds, and G and C using three hydrogen bonds, but you would also have to curl them up and create the double helix structure that we're so used to seeing now when we look at our illustrations. So go ahead and take a look at this. Here's the original model, and what we see happening is that the DNA basically coils around, almost like a little spiral staircase, allowing for the basis to be stacked in a very stable formation with hydrogen bonds being utilized between A and T and G and C, thereby giving rise to the double helix that is DNA. Now, in case you were wondering, is it possible for A to bind with G, C to bind with T? Yeah, completely. However, often it will lead to an unstable DNA molecule that will be more likely exposed to mutations and most likely will also fall apart during cell replication. So if you wanna create that perfect strand of DNA, you wanna go with A with T and G with C. And a quick note, you might also notice that if we're doing that, that means that we are matching a purine with a pyridine and a pyridine with a purine. So we're doing a double ring with a single ring and a single ring with a double ring. So it turns out perfectly balanced along the way. Another thing that I definitely have to mention to you is you remember how the backbone of your DNA, which your phosphate and your sugar, how it was pointed from five prime to three prime on one end? Well, it turns out that since DNA is a double helix, what we're gonna see happening is that the two strands are gonna run anti-parallel from each other. So if one starts with the five prime on top and the three prime at the bottom, then its complementary strand is gonna start with a three on top and a five at the bottom. And then obviously in between, we'll have our nucleotides. A will bond with T, C will bond with G. 
So this allows you to fully predict what the other side of the DNA will look like, both from a um, aspect of the five prime and the three prime, as well as how the nucleotides are binding to each other. So please keep that in mind. I also want to tell you that oftentimes as the helix starts to form, um, it can either twist to the right or to the left. Um, the right-handed side is the most commonly seen one, um, and as it's Twisting, what we see happening is that usually within one complete twist, you can have about 10 bases paired together. So here on this little illustration, we can see the right-handed turn of the helix. We can go ahead and you can see that they're following the A to C, the G to C ruling when it comes to pairing, utilizing hydrogen bonds. Notice also how they're running anti-parallel. So one strand will start with the five at the bar at the top, the three at the bottom, whereas the opposite strand will start with the three on top and the five prime at the bottom. It's all about orientation. And then the last thing it's showing you right here is that as it's bending towards the right, we see that it's creating turns. And within the turns, there's usually 10 of these nucleotide bases that we can house within it. And as it's turning, what it's doing is it's starting to interact with other molecules, like maybe water molecules, that are surrounding the DNA molecule. All right, so here we see the turn in a little bit more detail. And as it's turning, it also creates what we call grooves. These are going to be asymmetrical because you're going to have a larger groove, which is called the major groove, and then the minor groove, which is a little bit smaller. Um, and like I said, these are going to be infinite for interacting with other reagents or molecules that are surrounding it. A lot of times, these will make contact with water, since there's so much of that in um, the human body. Now, I said to you, DNA likes to twist to the right, but we also know through X-ray crystallography that it can also go ahead and bind to the left. So what we do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to call it B versus Z DNA. B DNA is the one that you find the majority of the time. This is the one that you're turning to the right. So that's the pictures that we were looking at before. However, we do see that sometimes you have one that will be left-handed turn. That is going to be our Z DNA. And we're not really sure why it turns Z, but it turns out that most research will point towards the fact that it will help you um, with your chromosome compaction. Um, because as you're doing your zigzags, you can actually increase the amount of bases that you have tilted towards a term. Usually you can go from 10 to 12 bases. So it will help you slightly with your compaction level. Um, other research has shown that it can also assist with transcription levels um, within the cell itself. Either way, what we see happening here in the illustration is that as you are doing your B turn and you're turning more towards the right, we see the stereotypical formation that we're so used to seeing when we see a DNA model. And then now, obviously, in addition to your double helix, you also see the mention of the major and the minor groove, okay? Now, on the other hand, if we're going to do our Z DNA, then what we see happening is because we're rotating more towards the left-hand side, instead of getting these grooves, we start getting more of a zigzag pattern that starts to develop. And that's then why it's called Z DNA. So right is more common, but left has also been seen. Okay. All right, now switching over a little bit to RNA now. Let's see, RNA we get, uh, people like to say RNA is the cousin of DNA. Um, but what we see happening is that DNA, especially in eukaryotic cells, is not able to leave the nucleus. And the DNA has all our genomic information. So what does the cell do? Well, it takes the section of DNA that it's interested in, aka the gene, and it does transcription. And when it does transcription, it copies the DNA into RNA. 
And the nice thing about RNA is that it's able to freely float in and out of the nucleus so it can proceed to the next step of translation, which is the production of your proteins. Now, when it comes to DNA to RNA, obviously besides genomic differences, there are also some structural differences, one of them being that RNA tends to be primarily single-stranded. RNA will have a ribosugar instead of a deoxyribose sugar. And when it comes to the interaction between the nucleotides, we see that there is no thymine, but there will be a uracil. And that means that if we ever do need to make it double-stranded and we need to get the nucleotides to interact, the G and C will still follow Gargaff's rule because guanine and cytosine are found in RNA, just as in DNA. But if it comes to your um, T, what we see happening is that if you have an adenine on one side and you need it to bind to RNA, it will have to bind with uracil because obviously there is no T in RNA. All right, so here's a look at the illustration of it. And you can once again see very similar to the setup that we had in our DNA. We have our phosphodiester linkage. We have our backbone with our phosphate and our sugar. We are still running in a opposite pattern when it comes to the prime. So notice five on top, three at the bottom as it orients. And then you have your bases on the side. Notice how three of them are very similar to DNA. And then obviously uracil will be the one that will be exclusively found in RNA. Now, because your RNA molecule is slightly long, we are used to seeing it single-stranded, but it's also quite common for it to form double-stranded structures when it comes across complementary base pairings, meaning that it will go ahead and do hydrogen bonds between the A and the U and the C and the G. When it does this double pairing, it tends to do it in a right-handed format. And we see that as the RNA keeps coiling up, the structure starts to become more complex. And you start getting things like base pairing and base stacking. And this will obviously not only compact the RNA, but it will also affect its interaction rate with different proteins and ions that you might come across. So RNA isn't always going to be a single structure. It is able to go ahead and amplify and become more complicated and upgrade its overall form. So for instance, let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of what we call secondary structures of RNA. So here we have our secondary structures, and what we're looking at here for is basically an upgrade from the single strand. So we can see that a lot of the complementary regions are interacting with each other using hydrogen bonds. And areas that don't necessarily have a complementary region, so non-complementary regions, they tend to be pointing outwards, so away from the bonds that are being created, away from the double-stranded region. Um, you can see we can have a bulge loop, an internal loop, a multi-branch junction, this one looks fancy, and then a stem loop. The stem loop is one of the most common ones. It's also called a hairpin because of the exertion of, or the sticking out of the loop. So these are all examples of secondary structures of RNA. Um, I also want to mention to you that when we look at RNA, RNA comes in different variations. And many of you might recall that when you were studying or when you were learning about transcription and translation, you came across the fact that you have mRNA, which is the messenger, you have rRNA, which works together with the ribosomes to read the messenger RNA and figure out which amino acids are required. And then you have tRNA. And if you're not really familiar with the RNAs, don't worry, you're going to come across them again in our next unit, Unit 3, when we start tackling um, transcription and translation. But I really quickly want to go ahead and mention tRNA or transfer RNA because this one is very unique in the fact that it's able to carry an amino acid on one side and an anti-codon region on the other side. So I'm going to show you this in the picture. And when I look at the picture, we want to make sure that we can find the amino acid and we want to make sure we find the anti-codon region. 
okay? And I'll tell you why that means for mRNA. Okay, so here's our illustration of tRNA. As you can see, it's a very complex structure. It has lots of double helixes that intertwine. And then the two main sections is that we're going to have an anticodon section and we're going to have the acceptor section. Now, the acceptor section is where your amino acids are going to be located. When you're doing translation, what you're doing is you are reading the message in mRNA, and you are trying to figure out which proteins to produce. And when you do this, it turns out that you have to read the mRNA in codons. Codons. What's a codon? Hopefully you're answering me, but <laughs> a codon is a three sequence nucleotide. So for instance, A, U, G. And it turns out, and you'll see this in your next few chapters when we do transcription and um, translation, your body has what we call a codon table. It has figured out all the different ways that we can put three of these nucleotides together and have them code for certain amino acids. So for instance, AUG is actually our start codon. It's the one that initiates translation. But you'll also have codons for things like proline, tryptophan, valine, all of the different amino acids that you need. And what we see happening in translation is that mRNA has the codon. So it has the instructions. And our RNA is the one that's reading the instructions. So it's reading the codons and it's figuring out <coughs> which amino acids are needed. But who brings the amino acids over? Well, that's what your tRNA does. And that's why tRNA is called the transfer RNA. And the transfer RNA will bring over the amino acid that the codon is calling for. And when it brings it over, it has to make sure that it's put in the proper formation, in the proper order. So what we see happening is that it has an anti-codon region that is complementary to the codon region. So if my codon is A, U, G, then my anticodon region would be its complementary region, which would be A goes with U, because remember there's no T, U goes with A, and G goes with C. So it is a complementary region to the codon and it's what the tRNA will use to double check that this is indeed the location where the specific amino acid has to go. So it's a pretty cool concept and it plays a very important role in our overall protein production. All right, um, this is our last slide for this part. So uh, let's talk soon for part three of unit two. All right, guys, and I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record. I get it. But any questions, comments, concerns, go ahead and shoot me that email or post it in the discussion session. We'll talk soon. Bye.